So this afternoon I'm going to be talking about the duffing oscillator and some of the differences between the duffing oscillator and a simple harmonic oscillator. So to start out with a little bit of background, um, it's very simple to a simple harmonic oscillator in that um, it's basically a spring that's connecting a um, one point to another point. In the case of the duffing oscillator, we can always imagine that one of the ends is fixed and the other end is free to move and they're connected by a spring. So this is a damped oscillator and it's a driven oscillator, meaning that there's some force that's um, slowing it down and there's some force that's um, kind of pushing it outward. With the simple harmonic oscillator, we have those things often, but what we don't have is this nonlinearity. So if you remember Hooke's law, which is F equals minus KX, that's the spring restoring force is equal to minus kx, where x is the stretch on the spring. So Hooke's law tells us um, that we have this simplification, where the spring restoring force is linearly proportional to the stretch on the spring. The duffing oscillator is different because the spring restoring force is not linearly proportional to it. There is this, uh, this nonlinear aspect to it. Um, and the nonlinearity is what really gives us some interesting dynamics to it. The best way that I can kind of describe it is in terms of maybe a planet orbiting a star. So you have the star in the center, which is more or less a fixed point, and then you have the planet orbiting around this star, where there's a gravitational force that's, um, that's pulling it in, and then there's also this push outward, and at the same time it's always orbiting around the star. So we'll start off with the basic equation. Um, I chose for this project to use an equation that had already been um, formulated and kind of take a look at the dynamics with it. So what we can tell here is we have a second order ODE. It's nonlinear because we have this x cubed term right here. There's this um, second order ordinary derivative. And then the other thing that you can tell from it is that there are tons of parameters involved with it. And there's, there's five parameters. We have delta, beta, alpha, gamma, omega, and um, I'll kind of talk a little bit about what those mean. The first thing that I want to say, though, is that in order to get this from a second order ODE down to a first order ODE, what I did is I said that the first time derivative of your x, which is our independent variable, is velocity. So um, the change in this position is its velocity, and the change in the velocity is equal to all of this on this side of the equation here. So it's equal to the acceleration term right here. We just have to rearrange that equation. Okay, so now for the parameters, we have delta, which is the damping force of the spring. We have beta, that's the coefficient on this nonlinear restoring force of the spring. So this is kind of like our, uh, our K in Hooke's Law. And then we also have alpha, which is the spring constant right here. This is our linear, um, this is our linear term. So this is just like some Hooke's Law, um, that term right there. And then also here we have this, uh, this cosine forcing term. So here we have gamma, which is the, the amplitude of that sine wave, so it's the amplitude of the driving force, as we call it, and then we have omega, which is the, the angular frequency of this oscillation. So that's a little bit about how um, the equation works, how I brought it down into a system of first order ODEs, and then we'll talk about what this, this system actually looks like. So let's take, for example, all parameters being equal to one to start off with. What we can do is we can visualize it using something called phase plot. So we see on the x-axis we have position, how far this object is stretched from the fixed point, and then here we have velocity. Starting out, all parameters equal to 1, we get this really nice orbit here. Um, and it runs for, for several time steps. You can definitely see how far it runs here. So this is just the most simple case. Then over here, you have beta and delta are equal to zero. So this is the case where you have, um, you have a damping force of zero, and then, uh, as you can see, it's being driven out further and further from the center. So these are our simple cases, but we can go to even more complicated cases. So what if we just um, fix all of our parameters at values that we've predetermined, and then just use one parameter? In this case, we're going to use gamma, our spring driving force. So let's make alpha minus 1, beta, delta, and omega are equal to 1 just to simplify things, and we're going to vary gamma and see what kind of results that we get. 
So again, we start out here with our spring um, initially at this position, and it kind of shoots outward. It's driven outward. Um, right here, gamma is pretty small. It's equal to 0.1, and we see that over time what happens is this damping and this driving force kind of reach an equilibrium, and it goes to a fixed orbit. If we increase the driving force by quite a bit, by nine times over here, we have a much different pattern that's going on here, where it's, it seems to be oscillating around a few points, um, and it definitely has um, larger amplitude. As you can see here, it goes in an X position of from 0.92 to 1.06, and it goes much farther. It's driven much farther in these, even though you can see that it starts at the same position in both. We get these very different dynamics. So what if we continue this process on? Let's say that alpha is minus 1, beta delta is equal to 1, and then 0.1. So what we're doing is we're decreasing our damping. And then omega is 1.4. So it goes up from 1 to 1.4. Um, and this is the frequency. So it's, it's orbiting this object faster and faster. We'll start it at the same initial position. Um, and for gamma of 0.09, we can see that it eventually it reaches this really nice fixed orbit and it kind of stays in that. Although there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of changing within this orbit over time. Um, and then what happens if we go from 0.09 and close to triplet, we get this behavior. So these are two attractors right here. It starts at this position and you can see it'll, it'll orbit around one of these points and then it'll kind of skip over to the other one and it'll bounce back and forth in this way. And this is where we get the idea of a chaotic system from. So this system is um, nonlinear, which gives rise to the mathematical chaos of it. Um, and what will happen in this equation is if you had two simulations with very similar initial conditions, you would see over time that their behavior would diverge quite a bit. Um, and, that's, and that's really the, the definition of a chaotic system, okay? What I want to do next is I want to show, we'll keep all of these parameters the same, but I want to show a plot of what happens if we evolve gamma in time. So we're going to start with gamma at zero, and I'm going to show you what the orbits look like as gamma gets larger and larger over time. So once again, gamma is starting at zero, and this, this animation shows that as gamma is moving forward, um, we get these oscillators going on here. And then you can see also that the spring orbit is being driven further and further outwards. Um, so once again, like I said before, it's always starting at this same position, but we get very different dynamics here just depending on what gamma is. So from one simulation to the next, we can vary gamma by a really small amount and get totally different things going on. So you can see the, the loops are fairly nice now, and in a second we're going to get um, we're going to get all sorts of crazy behavior again. So there are some there are some areas um, where the gamma is pretty simple, and one simulation to the next the orbits don't change a whole lot. And now we're reaching this area where just small changes in gamma change this orbit quite a bit. You can really see it going crazy now as it's. This oscillator is being driven further and further outwards. Um, yeah, and we're getting all sorts of crazy behavior here. Again, just starting from this same point, um, we get very different behavior. So that's one thing that we can do. We can, we can visualize how this orbit changes just by varying our gamma parameter. Once again, every, every, uh, every slide in this animation is a whole simulation that I've run with one gamma value. Okay, so that's one thing we can do. Another thing we can do is we can look at what are called Poincaré sections. Okay, so Poincaré sections are, you can imagine this oscillator, it's moving back and forth between this fixed point, but it's also oscillating around, it's orbiting in space. So what would happen if we took a slice, a subsection of the data, every time it crossed, for example, um, our, our angle theta equals zero. So it's doing this orbit, and every time it comes back to zero, we take another point. Then it goes around, comes back to zero, and we take another point. Well, these are called Poincaré sections. And I can show you an animation of what those look like. 
So once again, what I said, this is, we're going to start out with our theta equals zero. So every time this orbit comes back around to zero, we plot a point, let it go back around to zero, plot another point. And we just keep this going, we keep iterating it, and uh, we get something that looks like this. Now what I can do is I can run this animation, and I'm going to be stepping forward in theta. So we're going to be kind of moving around this orbit. And this is the behavior that we get. So over time, um, our oscillations will not always intersect at the same angle in every point. They'll, they'll change over time, and they'll change with the angle. So this is, um, this is another way that we can visualize our data. And as you can see, the, the simulation run ran pretty fast. Um, this an animation runs pretty fast. I only had um, probably about 100 different um, pictures so 100 different uh, theta, theta angle values in here. Okay. okay, so those are called Poincaré sections. And uh, so these are two very different ways that we can look at it, but still kind of show um, the really interesting behavior that we get from this simple ODE. Okay, so in conclusion, the Duffing Oscillator models spring motion, but not simple harmonic motion. You have a nonlinear restoring force as well as you also have um, damping and driving in this spring. What we showed the, the change with here is we varied gamma a lot. And if you, if you took the time to go through these simulations like I did, and you looked at all of the different parameters, you would see that gamma has a ton of control over how this thing behaves, and the other ones, not as much. So gamma is the fun one. Once again, the Duffing equation, the Duffing oscillator, is very sensitive to initial conditions. So this is truly um, a chaotic system. And you saw a couple of the methods that we have for visualizing, visualizing the evolution of this system. And I guess I don't need this slide.